This is not your typical car race. This is a race to make cars more like computers and smartphones and the best one to buy. No, it doesn't stretch. I don't want cameras anymore. I want map. Please slow down. Please don't hit the Tesla that we rented. Are you worried about dongles? A little bit, yeah. I spent the last month in search of the perfect EV for me and my family. That meant testing five leading options under $60,000 over the course of two months. The Kia EV6, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, the Tesla Model Y, the Volkswagen ID4, and the Ford Mustang Mach-E. After narrowing it down to three finalists, I took the remaining three on a road trip to this racetrack to pick the best one. I evaluated them on four features, battery life, charging, infotainment, and semi-autonomous driving. And yes, I factored in other important stuff too, including safety, handling, and... Why do you like this car? Because it farts. <laughs> Let's go! Lap one, battery life, or what EV people call range. One of the biggest pieces of criteria I had when selecting cars, a range of about 300 miles. To test, I recruited two of my colleagues, and together we drove the three cars on the same day, under the same conditions, to the same destination. That destination? Lime Rock Racetrack in Northern Connecticut, 130 miles north of my home in New Jersey. Before we hit the road, we made sure every car was charged up. Every car has to start at 100. And that all the air condition levels were the same. Each car was fairly new, with relatively low mileage. To start, Tesla took the lead, about 30 miles into the drive. What percentage are you at and how many miles does it say you have left? I have 94% and 278 miles. I'm on 93% and 266 miles. The Hyundai, however. I'm at 93%, 240 miles. To be fair, the Hyundai model I tested was rated for around a 260-mile range. The company says its rear-wheel drive model would have kept up. Here's how that played out for the rest of the two-and-a-half-hour drive. After being on the road for 75 miles, Tesla and Ford were neck and neck, around 210 miles left on the battery. Hyundai was at 190. There it is. Lime Rock Park. We did it. Finally, when we arrived at the track, both the Ford and Tesla had around 150 miles left to go. Hyundai was still behind. Still, because all these cars can be configured to hit a similar range, this lap is a... It's a tie. Lap two, charging. This is really where these cars are like smartphones. The Tesla uses its own proprietary charging connector and port, ahem, Apple. It's called Lightning. Which it now calls the North American Charging Standard. It also has its own Tesla chargers, which are dead simple to use after you've set up your account in the app. And green, that's it. Ford, Hyundai, and those other cars I tested use the Combined Charging System, or CCS port which work at different charging stations from various different companies. And I found some of those stations to be, well, unreliable. Please work. But even when they do work, I found that there are some big issues with these non-Tesla stations, which can all be illustrated in what happened in the beautiful town of Falls Village. Let me tell you a story about what happened here last night. Do you have, do you have service? We realized that the cars were too low to drive all the way home because we had used them at the track a lot. Figured, okay, we'll charge them overnight even though it's gonna be slow. We met Sema Connect, our not very good friend. Why would you be able to use Tap to Pay? No, you've gotta download their proprietary app. Turns out Sema Connect was acquired by Blink, so we had to ultimately download another app. A Blink spokesman told me that SemiConnect's transition to the Blink network may have caused an inconvenience for some users. The company also plans to add more chargers with credit card readers. SemiConnect was a slower charger, or a level two charger, and it took roughly six hours to charge the cars from 40% to 100%. All right, guys, take care of each other. DC fast charging, or what's sometimes referred to as level three, can do that in under an hour. And that's exactly what I did with the Tesla on the road trip. 
I've consistently found it easier to find Tesla fast chargers, called superchargers, especially in remote areas. The good news? Tesla has agreed to allow other cars from Ford, GM, and others to access superchargers in early 2024. And I think the winner here is pretty clear. The Tesla wins this round. Lap three, infotainment. Both Ford and Tesla have similarly sized tablets that have replaced pretty much all the buttons, knobs, and dials. Okay, Ford kept this knob and this 10.2 inch screen above the steering wheel so you can easily see vital information, like how fast you're going. With the Tesla, I had to look over to the right to see that information. Hyundai also has two screens like the Ford. This display here, this is teeny tiny compared to the Mustang and to the Tesla. Feels like a display for ants. Of course, it's the software on those screens that matters most. Tesla has its own software. Its navigation system is built with Google Maps data, but it's not the Google Maps app. The media apps like Apple Music and Spotify are built in. You just sign into your account on the screen. Play Fallout Boy, We Didn't Start the Fire. And you can pair your phone via Bluetooth. Ford and Hyundai have their own software as well, which is not as good as Tesla's. What is this mess? This whole navigation feels like 1995, like a map quest situation here but they also have Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. Specifically, Mustang has wireless CarPlay. No wires, check it out. With the Apple and Google software, you do lose some of that car and battery integration, which really shines in the Tesla. So as soon as you route to a charger, it will say preconditioning battery for fast charging. The biggest decision I have to make, how badly do I want Apple CarPlay? 2023, baby, no wires. So yeah, for this lap, it's a tie. Tesla and Ford. Lap four, semi-autonomous driving. This is very nerve wracking when there's traffic. Small breaths, trusting Tesla with my life right now. All these cars have active driving assistance features, which include adaptive cruise control and lane centering, so the car can control the speed and steering on a highway. In the Hyundai, using these features requires Keep hands on steering wheel. But Ford and Tesla have more capabilities in this area. Ford's Blue Cruise prompts you to take your hands off the wheel on highways. Oh God, is it gonna do it? Even for lane changes. You just press on the turn signal and... Okay, it's preparing for another lane change. Woohoo! All right, it did it, it did it. Slow down, slow down. And it slowed down. When you enable Tesla's enhanced autopilot, it does tell you to keep your hands on the wheel at first. But in my tests, it behaved just like the Ford. All right, let's see if it'll change lanes. Oh, it's changing lanes. Oh boy, okay, that is not as smooth as the, the Ford. There's just one tiny question to ask yourself here. Which company are you gonna trust with your life? That is if you can actually trust the computer to do the driving. Tesla has additional self-driving features, but I kept taking over the wheel when testing them. It's got enough, it's got enough. Nope, I got off. I don't know if it was gonna get off. I didn't trust it and I did it. Overall, I found Ford's Blue Cruise easier to figure out and more informative. And that's really what you want in a situation where the computer is your co-pilot. Says lane change is not available right now. The Ford wins this round. As much as I like the Hyundai's exterior look and ultra fast battery charging when I did find a fast charger, it wasn't gonna be my next car. But even after that road trip and all that track testing, I didn't have a decision between the Ford and the Tesla. Plus, this really did feel like a more emotional decision than my next laptop or phone. So I decided to phone or Zoom a friend who has reviewed more EVs on YouTube than I could count. Hey, I'm Marquez Brownlee, AKA MKBHD. What would you consider if you were deciding between these two cars? I'm not surprised that these are your two final options. They're both really good. I'd be asking you questions like, what are you gonna do with it? I literally don't recommend non-Tesla EVs to people who actually road trip with any regularity. So if that's something you plan on doing more than a few times, it might be worth it just for that. Given that this is a second car for my family, I don't expect I'd road trip more than two to three times a year with the EV. Plus, I'm going to install a home charger, and next year Ford will be able to use those Tesla chargers. But Marquez was incredibly helpful in seeing the bigger picture. We saw the curve with phones go like this, 
and then sort of even out and now they're mature and they get a little bump every year. I think with cars, we're right here with electric cars. We're at the beginning. So I should lease. I leased my first EV and I have no regrets about that. I think in three years, your computer on wheels will be much better. And that's what I've decided to do. Lease a Ford Mustang Mach-E for 36 months. And I'll buy a CCS to Tesla adapter when it's available. Because, well, I've always dreamed of having a dongle to charge my car. And that's the end of my game show.